Today we talk about scale. How do we scale our application and what does this mean? Um, our agenda today is we talk about a little bit what is scaling vertically and what is scaling horizontally. One is also scaled up and one is called scaled out. It's pretty much the same. Um, we talk about why scale up isn't always possible because there are some limitations of CPU counts available and everything like that. We talk about different strategies, how we scale an application. Um, scaling an application is very application dependent and what what your possible what the possible strategies are but we talk about some more general strategies that exist that are obviously not all strategies that exist but that, that are the most strategies i most of the time leverage to to fix some scaling issues in my applications and then we discuss the strategy for our world chat how we make our world chat scale what is the limitation of this strategy and why is it okay for us to go with those limitations for now and then we see that in action today. So scaling vertically basically means make the machine bigger. So if, if we look at CPU count for example and let's say you have a virtual machine or a virtual server with one CPU in it and you want to scale it vertically or scale it up, then you take a machine with two CPUs or more. And in the same manner, scaling horizontally or scaling out is basically adding more machines. Instead of making the machine bigger, we add more machines. But our software needs to, to work with that and needs to be able to do that. When, when I started backend development, scaling upwards, so making the machine bigger, was in the beginning cheaper than scaling horizontally. But very fast after four or eight CPUs, scaling horizontally became extremely cheaper than scaling upwards. Uh, so making the machine bigger normally gets more expensive in, in the long run, but is cheaper at the start. And adding more machines is basically a linear uh, cost development. So this in the long run will stay cheaper. But for a CPU count, let's say for 20, 32 CPUs, we can see that this is now shifted and the price, at least in Azure, stays pretty much the same. When we look at the graph, when we just look at the A2 vertical machines, which may basically means scaling the machines vertically and at the bottom of the, of the graph, you see how much CPUs we have. And when we scale vertically, you see that the price for A2 machines is pretty much the same as the price when we scale horizontally with AV version 2 machines. But the issue you will encounter when you scale vertically that there is no AV2 machine bigger than 8 CPUs. So if you want to have 16 CPUs, 20, 32, then you basically have to add more machines. So your software needs to be able to scale horizontally very fast if you go with a V2 machines. If you go, for example, with, if we do the same thing for DV2 machines, then you can see it, it's pretty much the same price. And then at 20 machines, it's actually more expensive to go to scale vertically, then you scale horizontally. And again, uh, the Azure calculator doesn't give me an option to go with DV2 machines bigger than 20 CPUs, same issue and so on and so on. This, this difference in price was way higher when, when I started backend development years and years ago. This shows that, that still, if your backend needs more than 20 CPUs, um, 
you might want to go with F2 machines. F2 machines have the option to go to 32 CPUs, which is basically the same price of, as if you scale horizontally. What I did with, with the horizontal scaling, I took the cheapest machine, let's say for, for DV2, it's one CPU, and I added the machine to get to the CPU count. But still, the, depending how much power your backend needs, you will need to scale horizontally eventually. Let's say you need 300 plus CPUs in your backend, then this you, you won't get that quite easily in one machine. I know people who, who think that scaling upwards is always possible, but currently there, there is an issue with, with that idea. And I want to demo that for you. So I have a new folder in, in our Git repository, which is called showcases. You have to get the latest, latest and greatest version in the Git repository to have this, but it's in there. And we shortly go over the source code, which is straightforward. I hope this is good readable. So we have a main, main thread. We, we enter the pro program here. We read out how many processors we have, and we have a counter which stands at 100,000. And what we will do, we will run a calculation, which is basically a very dumb calculation, um, which just 10,000 times uh, do calculate uh, the square root of, of an arbitrary number. And we do that 100,000 times. So 100,000 times we calculate 10,000 square roots, which is one, one billion square roots. It's a one with nine zeros. So it's one billion. We, we have different strategies to do that. First of all, we, we have the dumbest we can do. We have a loop and we just do it in a loop for 100,000 times. And there, there's actually a big issue with that. This doesn't scale up pretty well. And we, I will explain why. And then we have two distribute strategies. One is we do our 10,000 square root calculation in, 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 in a, its own thread and that for 100,000 threads. And the other thing is we do it, we, we calculate how much cost we have and we split the calculation with those cores. So we have eight cores, we want 100,000 times, so it will be 12,500. So each core will calculate 12,500 12, times the 10,000 square roots. And if everything is done, we, we will get, get the time and we will average the timeout. So we will have an average counter, the time will add up, the average counter will increase by one each time. We divide that by each other so we get the average time it took. So when I run the pro the, pro the program locally, it will detect that my, my notebook has eight CPU cores. There we go. And interestingly enough, Splitting the threads by the cores is more efficient than just making a thread for everything. That's the case because thread management will take over and having so many threads makes the management take so much time that it's more valuable to just make one thread per each core. Um, the CPU can't process more than that anyway. So that, that's the best case scenario, what we have here. And that's what the numbers reflect. Um, I have a four core machine, but with hyper-threading, I have eight cores. And today we will leverage Kubernetes in, in the demos, but we will make a whole video about Kubernetes. And that's why, please bear with me that you might not know anything. If you don't know anything about Kubernetes, this might be um, pretty hard to follow, but I, tr I try my best to, to explain what, what I'm doing without going too deep in Kubernetes for now. 
The only thing interesting here, you can ignore the top part, which is basically make this image run in Kubernetes. And what I can do, I can limit the resources my container has available. And this is a milli CPU, so 500 milli CPUs basically means half of a CPU. So we are here in, in this YAML file and I open a PowerShell window here. What I can do is basically with cube control, which is basically Kubernetes command line tool, uh, apply dash f, which file do I want to deploy to the Kubernetes cluster? We want to deploy our test. And um, what we can see here now is um, we can get our pods. Um, a, a pod is a deployable unit in Kubernetes, which in this case runs our container. And this is limited to the CPU. And what we can do now is we can get the logs, which in a Console application is basically our console output, and there you go. We have in one thread it it ran took eleven to twelve seconds to do that. In distribute it took also very long time, and when we distribute by core, which is just one thread, they basically all do the same because you, we, we just have one CPU core available, but because I have a multi-core CPU, it, it might get some benefit, but as you can see, the average, it will average out. It, it will pretty much take the same, the same time. And when we want to scale up, let's say we have one full CPU available, and let's deploy that again. Then we need to get our pods again because our pod has a different now. Because the other one is and this one is started. We get the pods again. It doesn't block something. There you go. It's, it's faster now. See, we have the CPU available. Um, it's not faster the one method than than the other. It it's really lucky depending on what my my PC is doing apart from just running that. So when Windows is doing something in the back in the in the background for example, recording this video, then obviously this will take some sometimes more time and sometimes less. And here you see it's pretty much the same throughout. But if we give it two CPUs now, let, let's remember that one took five or five to six seconds. And there you go. It's uh, it's six seconds again. So if, if our application is programmed like, like the one thread thing here, then doesn't matter how much we scale up or scale out the, the machines, it doesn't get better than that. It's still five to six seconds it takes, but it, if our software has developed with, with multi-threading and scaling in mind, li like the other two examples here, we see that, that they get twice as fast. When I go to four, CPUs, for example, I think you get the idea, it, it becomes even faster. So now it's even faster and if we give it 8 CPUs just, just for, for good measurement. Also what I didn't mention, sorry, here in this um, line you can always see how much CPUs are available for the system. So this will become an 8. Since this is hyper-threading, the, that's not a, a full CPU, so it, it doesn't half the time, but it's, it's pretty close. This was a small demo about this topic. There's a small disclaimer about partitioning. There's something 
in SQL tables where you where you partition SQL tables, which is completely different about the partitioning that we talk about in, in this presentation. So I just want to notice you when I talk about partitioning here in this presentation, I don't mean partitioning SQL tables. So scaling an application. There are basically different strategies to work with your application when it is under heavy load. The most and simple strategy, which is what most people aim for and which is the best thing you can do basically, is to have your applications scalable so that when you boot up multiple versions of that, it can handle more load. There are different sub-strategies that make this available for your application. For example, if your service is completely stateless, then obviously you can run 20 of those instead of just one and everyone can connect to whatever of those 20s and they can serve hopefully 20 times more people than, than just one instance of your, of your service. Then there's also stateless with an external data source, for example, an SQL or no SQL database or a Redis cache on whatever your external data source is. You have to keep in mind, even though your load can handle more people if you scale it up, uh, if you scale it out, sorry, but that doesn't mean that your data source can. Let's say your service is at 100% load and then, but you need to handle four times the load and then you say, okay, let me spin up just three more services. So I have four, I can process four times the load, but then you will shift the problem to your data source and you have to keep in mind that everything needs to be scalable to, to make this possible. And there's another thing um, which is called partitioning or data sharding. Another strategy would be to delay the execution. We will talk about that a little bit. You, instead of directly processing everything, you, you delay the processing to, to unblock a client. I have a good example for that one. And another strategy is to just give weight limitation. For example, if you want to log into a chat group in StarCraft 2, then there's a maximum of 200 persons per chat. So, and you also have a weight limitation in how much messages you can send in one chat per second. Uh, I think it's five messages or something per second. So they know there, there, there won't, there will never be more than 1000 messages per second in a chat in StarCraft 2. And th that's, that gives them the opportunity to scale their application with that in mind. Let's first of all talk about delaying an execution. On the right side, I, I made a, an, a graph how, how this might look like. And on the left side, I, I explain this scenario, for example. Let's say we have a video conversion platform and video conversion takes time. We have a client front end where, which uploads the video somewhere and then we get we come to our web service and we get the message can you please convert this video for us and since the client doesn't want to want to block the ui we want to give the client back directly something he can work with and what we do is we we add the conversion process to a queue and we directly send um, a unique identifier to the client back. And now the client can always come back and ask, for example, for how fast my conversion already. Is it in queue? Is it processed? And if it's processed, how much? Is it 50% done, 45% done and everything? And we then have some worker services at the at the back end which takes those queue and processes those videos and actually doing the hard work and obviously we need to have a feedback loop so that the web services has some kind of knowledge 
which video is processed and how far it's processed. But I, th I think this, this shows the idea how we unblock the, the client with delaying execution. That's a typical scenario how one of the strategies work. The other strategy is stateless, which is the simplest strategy you can have. Let's say your, your service doesn't have a state it manages, which doesn't mean it doesn't have config files or something. So, But each service has on its same disk or in memory all data it needs plus the request input it gets from the client. I've made an example here with calculating damage. Let's say we have a damage service which just calculates how much damage is done. And he gets as input the armor, the, the attack from, from the attacker and armor and attack from the defender and he, he does some fancy calculation and just gives out the number how big is the damage done. Maybe he reads some configuration and and everything in memory, and but every service has that in memory. So when we boot a service up, everyone has that data available. Then let's say those three ser services are at 100% load. And again, we, we need to spin up another one. The load balancer will detect there is another service and will give load to the other service also which will reduce the load on, on the three services that we had before. That's basically how, how a stateless system works. This is the best case scenario, but obviously that's not always possible because you want to have some data and then you have stateless with external data source, which is basically the same thing with the database behind it. And like I said, you, you have to think about how does the database scale when I scale up my, my services, we talked about that. Can spin up more services, but that this obviously means also more, more concurrent load on the database. Since in our case, we are using Cosmos DB and Cosmos DB has an interesting strategy in, in scaling itself and it's using partitioning. What we can do is we can, for example, this is a, a fictionary scenario, for example. We can do partitioning and data sharding on database side. For example, one, one idea is we, we have multiple databases and depending on, on for example, the, the first character in our email address, we have a different database. And our login services are again stateless with a with an external data source, so we can spin up endlessly on those sites, but they will introduce more load on, on the database side. But instead of just having one database, we have four of them. And if the email of a client starts with a zero, it will go to the email zero database. If an email starts with a C, then it will go to emails A to M database in this case. And this, this is called basically data sharding or in application level it's called partitioning. This works like you have a deterministic way to detect where you need to go. That, that's basically the simplest explanation. And Service Fabric is, is a server orchestrator from Microsoft which implements an actor model. I don't want to go deep into that, but they, the, the thing is the system needs to understand, for example, in the actor model, needs to understand where do I find this one person with this identity, with this unique identifier. And this, the strategy from Service Fabric is that we have a long value and each service or, or data store has, has a range of long values that belongs to them. For example, um, let's say you have two instances of your stateful service and instance one gets minus maximum long value to zero and the other one 
get one to maximum long value. And then what they do is they hash the identifier you give it. This can be a string, GUID or whatever. And they hash it into a long value. And the hashing mechanism is deterministic. So when you give it the same name or the same GUID, there's always comes the same long value. And since the there's a partition table which says this service has the range minus long to zero and this service has the range one to maximum long. And depending on on which side you come out, it will go to service zero or to service one. And you can scale that up, let's say, you, you have 10 services, then each service will, from the whole range from long min value to long max value, it will get one tenth of this part. And depending on what your hashing algorithm gives you, you will connect to the, co to the service. Which basically looks something like that. Um, the service itself has its own database which in service fabric case, just for full information, in service fabric case, a stateful service uses its own disk. So the database it's, is on disk on the machine. And we could do the same with, with Kubernetes. That's basically how in best case scenario you scale a stateful application with a data source. This is basically how, how you can scale an application with a data source that each service instance of your stateful service has its own part in the database or maybe it's even its own database when when you you could deploy your own database with the service in Kubernetes for example. And then each each of those instances could could share their own database. For example, a, a simple scenario would be we, we have a chat service and when someone connects to the chat service, we want to store that this person is online or not. And we could do the same logic that we did before. We, we have a partition with, with the first character in, in the email address and depending on which character is in the email address at first place, you connect to the right service to get or set those information. This is basically how partitioning or data sharding works. It gets kind of messy when you find out, for example, in this case, we have four partitions and oh my God, I need eight partitions because my system needs to scale then things will get complicated because we have to define the migration path and everything. And let's say we have eight partitions now, then we need to decide which partition gets what information and we obviously need to migrate the data over and everything. That's why it's always a good idea to decide for more partitions than what you normally need so that you already have a buffer. But the same with the CPU management is also the case here. The more partitions you have, the more management overhead you have, obviously. So then you don't want to go with, oh, he said we should take more partitions than we need. Just take 1 million partitions and we will be fine forever. That's obviously not a good idea. 10 to 100 partitions is basically what, what you see quite often. Now we need to discuss what, what do we do with, with our chat. We have a world chat, so when a message is sent, everyone gets this message. For example, when you have a map chat only for players in the map, we could limit that quite well because we, only players in the map, let's say we have 100 or 1000 players on each map, then only those 1k people need to be served with, with the data and that's not too hard to do. Let's say what we also could do with a, with a map chat is make multiple instances of one map. Let's say we only want 100 players per map, but if more players than that start on the same map, we spin up a new service with, with the same map in place and they have their own boundary then 
we, we have a maximum of 100 players per, per chat on map side. Since this is a world chat, this doesn't apply here. This is a worst case scenario. Everyone that connects to this chat get every data. We distribute the problem. We have our chat services and we have an external data source if we want to, which is in this case a Redis. We leverage the Redis just for speed. Redis is really fast and since we don't want to persist the chat messages, if someone chat some, wrote something in world chat, it gets distributed to everyone. We don't need to save it on disk or anywhere. Redis is a really good idea here. We could scale endlessly on the chat server side. People could connect to it and they get the messages or send messages over the Redis with a pub sub mechanism. In the long run, when we do heavy load testing in the world chat on this case, then the Redis will be the bottleneck because we can scale the service endlessly basically, but the Redis will, there will be a time when the Redis will have problems um, with all the messages that come in. There are different strategies that we could do to scale the Redis. For example, we could make multiple Redises and get the, the load over that by partitioning. Another thing, and that's what, what we will do, is we will limit the messages that people can send per second to the world chat. In most MMORPGs, which are free to play, it's even a paid service to write a message to world chat. I digged around some numbers and I found out that Final Fantasy XIV, for example, has a peak of 41,000 whatever concurrent users. A CC use is concurrent users and which means the amount of users that are online at the same time. And this number is actually lower than I thought it would be. And which means, for example, let's say we, we allow a player in World Chat just one message per minute. If, if he sends more than one message per minute, it gets rejected. He gets a message, you can only send a, a message one message per one minute in 29 seconds you can send the next message something like that depending on how much time he has which means when we have 41,000 concurrent users and they can send one message per minute means we have roughly 700 messages per second which is no problem our redis can easily handle that every time you you want to scale your application or you make a decision li like this, this graph, for example, you have to keep in mind what do you scale for. Let's say we scale for the 700 and we, we have a blockbuster game and at the beginning we even beat Final Fantasy XIV, which I don't think we will do, but let's, let's assume we do that and we, we need to have some kind of buffer. We don't want to be to scale for 700 messages per second and, and our system will crash if we go beyond that. But still we have to have a feeling how much load will the system have to handle. And sometimes if you look at the numbers, it's not that scary anymore. But if, if we don't make a weight limitation here, then we, we might have a problem. We, we might have a problem just by by some people connecting to the system and spamming messages in the world chat. Weight limitation is something which is very handy and you should always consider having weight limitation. So in the world chat for the end of the presentation, we go for a, a mixed strategy. We go for stateless with an external data source, which is the Redis, which has the problem that the Redis needs to be able to handle the load. And we do some weight limitation. And with that, we have a solution which is pretty solid and we won't have problems. Now you can say, okay, but one message per minute, nobody chats like that. We will have whisper chat, party chat, map chat, and, and other ways to communicate with each other, which scale completely differently. For example, map chat basically scales. Let's say we limit 100 players per map instance, and then maximum of 100 player 
then we say you can send one message per second which basically means again we, we just have 100 messages per second at maximum let's say for party chat we we can go crazy because a party maximum is four players or whatever our game design is and four players we we don't fear having four players um, when communicating with each other overloading the system and things like that but still even though we don't fear them overloading the system we will do rate limitation because there's always this one funny guy who will whatever reason spam within with an external tool which where he found out how or with a bot where he hacks into your client and and will spam your backend system with with some kind of garbage and you always pretty much always want to have weight limitation when you have an api public let's check out the source code and how how the client works and what we need to change in our chat i've made a lot of um, refactoring and this is the latest state of the git but we will just look at the chat and what the chat does it's quite simple we we have a non-scalable chat already but we need to scale it what we need to add is basically our redis our external data source i wrote a small wrapper for the publish subscribe part of redis and what we do is when we receive a message from from the UDP side, from the client, we will publish the message via Redis, which is basically we, we take the message and we send it to Redis. Our channel is World Chat. So in Redis, there's a channel World Chat and we will send a message to that channel. And on the other side, each service can subscribe to Redis which we do when the when the service starts up we subscribe to our world chat and every time when a message when we receive a chat message in the world chat we send it to everyone that is connected to us in summary our service boots up subscribes to redis to the world chat every time it receives a message it will send this message to everyone connected to this service instance. On the other side, when we receive a message from the from the client, then we will write the name of the client in the chat message. So even though when the, when the client abuses our API and writes a different name in that, the server will overwrite it. And then we publish this message to Redis. So every instance of the service will get the message and will distribute it over to every person connected to it. I again have a configuration in Kubernetes, which I don't want to go into deep. But what I do is I boot up two instances of the word chat. One is listening on port 30002 and one is listening, sorry, the bottom one, one is listening on the port 30003. And we will have two chat participants, one will connect to one of those and the other one will connect to another one and maybe we boot up another one which will connect to any of those. And we will see that each message will go the whole loop and come back. The problem is why I leverage multiple ports is a bug in Docker for Windows. Docker for Windows has a bug that I can't do session affinity with node port or load balancer. Because normally the I could just say, I need two replicas, then it will boot up the service two times. But since when, when we connect to one of those instances, we want to have all our messages going to that one instance. Let me show that to you in the graph here first. When, when we come to the load balancer, let's say our client A comes to the load balancer and connects to the first service. 
Now client B comes to the load balancer, connects to the second service. When client A again sends a message, we need to have the message sent to the first service because this service handles the connection. This service is the only server that knows that this client is this person because we simulate TCP connections with UDP. And Docker for Desktop has a bug with UDP and session affinity. This is called sticky session or session affinity. There are different names for that. And this sticky session has a bug in Docker for Windows. So this doesn't work. And that, that's why I can't just say hey, we have two replicas and I, I can show that them connecting. This, this works randomly because um, when I have two services instances and I write a message and I, it connects to the wrong service, then the service doesn't know about the connection and my UDP library supports that. And what the UDP library does, it gives you an unconnected message. Then you come out in this endpoint, which is basically we received a message, but this person never connected with our connection handshake to us, and this won't work. This, this will work in, in the cloud easily because AKS doesn't have this bug. The load balancer of Azure is able to do sticky connections. But just for this showcase, I mean for local debugging, it's fine enough to just have one instance because we do load testing and everything in the cloud. But to show this, I, I need to have two instances running so that we can see that over Redis, when I send one message, both instances get those messages. So let me boot that up. So when we deploy everything, then I have a tool installed. I will write a link in the description, which is Lens for Kubernetes, and which basically shows what runs in my Kubernetes cluster. And we have a login service, a character service, which we will talk way later. We have our Redis and we have our two chat instances running. And our chat clients needed an upgrade. Um, it basically just logs in, creates a character because we need a character now because this is the latest state. We will make a video about that. Then we do some chatting. Let me start it up and you will see what will happen. I have to enter an email address which is used for registration and a very secure password, which is basically the email address itself. And then I have to enter a character name. Let's pick XXX. We got the character and now the client asks us to which chat we want to connect. We said yes, which basically connects us to port 30002. And this is connected. We can test that. We can send a message hi and we get xxx sent hi. We start a new instance. Debug start new instance. Now we have xxx on the right side and we do the same thing here with a different name. We connect. We enter YYYS name and now we want to connect to the other one, which is 30003. And now when we send a message, the message will go to the surf service, we'll send it via Redis. Both instances will get the message from Redis and will send it to everyone who is connected. And that's basically how this works. We could, for good measure, Connect the third one. Doesn't matter if the password isn't the email, it's it's the password that we choose since this is a new registration. So let's connect to, to 30002 again and 
let's pray to the demo gods and hi how are you and everyone gets the message i'm fine and this is completely working like it's intended to that's it for the video today i have a new microphone so please leave in a comment if the sound is better or worse if if it's worse then i will go back to the old one obviously and please like comment and subscribe have a good day have a good weekend bye